Last week, I was teaching violin and viola at a summer camp, which left me with very little time to make development progress on the game. So it's time for a format break! Usually in these videos, I'm showing you the small scale of progress, like a new enemy or some new art or a new boss or a new mechanic. Stuff that you can look at and go, ah, that's neat, and then be on to the next one. If you've been following along for a while, you have a bunch of bits and pieces of the game floating around in your head and hopefully making connections and seeming like, oh, that'd be part of a pretty cool game. But it's clear from some of the comments and FAQ that I get that the overall structure of the game is not necessarily as clear. So that's what I'd like to lay out for you today. Kind of a loose game design document in video form. We'll start with the intro scene, we'll go into the overall gameplay loop, character and story progression, and finally talking about plans for the other features that I want in the game, and what you can expect after the 100 days is over. I'm gonna try to keep this video pretty clear of story spoilers, but if you're somebody who likes to go into a game leaving absolutely everything to be discovered, mechanics and story, this might not be the video for you. So let's dig in. We'll start with the intro scene. We see our hero, the young poet Samuel Durant, in his room. He comes downstairs into the drawing room of a luxuriously appointed Victorian manor. Gathered around are many of his father's associates, and across from him sits a lawyer at a desk. The lawyer gives a small speech describing Charles as a ruthless boss, a cunning lender, a frugal philanthropist, and the architect of half of modern Paris. He laments, rather unconvincingly, Charles's disappearance into the catacombs a month prior, mentioning a promise of eternal life below that was apparently not achieved, and expresses everyone's excitement for Samuel to command the inheritance. But Samuel himself looks dazed and concerned, especially as everyone gathers closer. The lawyer opens the will and begins to read, and here we have a voiceover of Samuel's father's voice. Samuel, this is my final will and testament. If by chance you have exited your room to hear this read, I wish you to know only of my disappointment. In any endeavor, be it banking or sport or adventure or even your chosen hobby horse, poetry, one common trait is required to make something of one's life. Daring. Thus, I have elected to leave my empire to the boldest spirit remaining in this estate. Samson, who will at least from time to time brave a table to snatch a fish. The onlookers clear out and Samuel is left alone. After a one-sided conversation with Samson, the cat, he works his way up to anger and decides he's going to storm down to the catacombs to do what his father couldn't. Claim eternal life for himself. The mausoleum that leads down to the catacombs is conveniently right across the street. He'll walk through a cemetery, into the front doors, and descend. Inside, he'll meet old Red Eye for the first time. Red Eye is amused at Samuel's quest and tests him a little bit. This will function as the tutorial section. You'll learn the basics of parrying, catching, throwing, and dodge rolling. Red Eye will then offer you a special lantern. If Samuel dies while holding it, he'll be returned up to the surface. When he asks Red Eye what Red Eye will get out of this, he just says, we'll see. From there, your first run begins. You enter the catacombs area. This is called the Explore Phase. You encounter the Reaper for the first time, and you can apply the skills you learned during the tutorial to fight enemies and get as far as possible. As you run, your lantern oil burns down and your light shrinks. You can refill it by defeating enemies or destroying boxes, but certain things will make it go down faster, like being close to the Reaper or the ghosts. Whenever you arrive at a power-up, you'll have a moment to pause and collect yourself. A save point sigil appears, the reaper stops pursuing you, and your oil won't burn down. Most of these power-ups will be prayer beads, which provide small but impactful stat upgrades such as air jumps, reduced light burn rate, and increased bash damage, but sometimes full-blown relics will appear, and sometimes you'll encounter health restoration items like the blood salve, or get an influx of cash in the form of a diamond. Speaking of cash, the enemies also reward you with a currency called Viatica. These are named for the coins that might be placed over the eyes of or in the mouths of corpses when they're buried. They're the main buying power in Death's Domain, and you'll use them in the next phase, the shop. The shop currently has two vendors. One is the bead trader, affectionately called Jeff by my Discord crew. Their function is to take two of your beads, and then they'll offer you one that matches one that you already have. Ideally, this will help focus your build, but it's also a little bit of a gambling game. There's also a shop for you to spend your Viatica on, with two relic offerings that are random, and then one blood salve that helps you heal. That costs 10. 
Later on, you'll get the ability to re-roll the offerings. Relics are always designed in such a way that they provide unique benefits and aren't stackable. Some will shift your strategy in certain directions, like trying to maintain a high level of light in your lantern or trying to maintain a low level of light. And some are just a little bit wild, like letting you bounce off the heads of enemies to deal damage. After the first shop, you fight the first boss. This will always be Guillaume Obligé, the grave digger who guards the portal to death's true domain. After defeating him, he lets you pass, and you have another shop phase where you can heal up, buy relics, or trade beads. Prior to this point, you've just been in the regular catacombs, but below there are areas ruled by the Severed Souls, powerful entities who were once mortal but sought immortality. The strength of their will bends the magic of death's domain and shapes the world around them to their liking. If you've been following along, you've already seen four of the Severed Souls and watched two of their areas approach completion. There's Augusta, the scientist, working and studying within her lair in the Infinite Machine. There's Silas, the monk, and his chained monastery that treats pain as the path to enlightenment. And there's Eudor the pirate, fused onto the mast of his ship and doomed to be the Reaper's ferryman. The mid-range of a run will follow the same pattern the catacombs did. You'll enter an explore area, pass through a shop, fight the boss, and then you'll get another shop. Once you make it through the catacombs though, you'll always be able to choose between two areas. I'm keeping it flexible as to which areas are offered when, but for example, after the catacombs, you might have the option to go to the infinite machine and the chained monastery. After beating two severed souls regions, you'll enter the semi-final area. This is going to be a part of your run every single time since it's really important to the story. It's the area owned by your father, Charles. If you defeat him, you'll reach the Grim Reaper Sanctum, which is going to be a shorter area that's kind of more of a chase scene. In that scene, you're going to be looking for the Reaper's altar and the heart that makes him vulnerable. Finally, you can have a real boss fight with the Reaper instead of just running from him. But it won't be until you've reached some of the other conditions that you can see the endings of the game. So whether you win or lose that fight, that's a run. If at any point you die, Red Eye's Lantern will return you back to the mansion and you can try again. So this is the perfect time to talk about meta progression. At the mansion, you'll be able to upgrade Samuel. You can increase his stats, you can unlock new relics, maybe there's gonna be some other mechanics that open up as you keep going. There's gonna be another kind of currency that you get while you're down in Death's Domain, and I haven't decided exactly what it's called yet, but it's gonna be something like inspiration or insight or truth, and then you can sit down at your desk and write a poem, and that's what's going to upgrade your abilities and stats. Now, at first, I wasn't sold on the idea that there should be any kind of meta of progression. Philosophically, the idea of a game design that keeps unlocking as you as the player gain your skills and knowledge is really appealing to me. I was watching a Game Maker's Toolkit video where he was making a pretty similar argument, and I was nodding along. But then I saw this comment that was like, yeah, but I play games to have fun, not to get another skill. And I thought, yeah, I get it. Meta progression basically works like a built-in difficulty slider. The more an inexperienced player plays, the more skill they'll gain, but also the stronger Samuel will become. It makes every run feel like you're progressing towards something. Meanwhile, a skilled player will end up beating the game quite a bit sooner, and that's their reward for being more skilled. My plan at the moment is to balance the game so that a successful first run is possible, but very challenging. Then I can offer some ways of pumping up the difficulty after that for the players who want it. This design should offer something for players at all levels on the skill spectrum. And of course, all that is easier said than done. Okay, next, let's talk about story progression. In order to deliver some more juicy lore, the explore areas will sometimes spawn lore rooms that leave behind documents and stuff like that, and sometimes you'll find a special collectible called a facet that you can spend after a boss fight to get to know them better. I want to leave this a little bit mysterious for now, but I think the aesthetics that I have planned will not disappoint you. As of now, reaching the true ending will require the use of these collectibles. Meanwhile, you'll be deepening your relationships with the characters, both in Death's Domain and at the Manor, and the truth of the Durant family will come to light. See, I told you I'd be pretty spoiler free. Okay, so here are some more features that I've been really hoping to get to add. First, of course, is the minigame. If you remember from a few weeks ago, to celebrate reaching 10,000 subscribers, 
subscribers on this channel, I launched a minigame contest. And within a few days, there were already almost 300 entries, which is wild. At this point, I've only skimmed through some of them and I've already seen so many incredible ideas that I know this is gonna be almost impossible. So my Discord mods have graciously agreed to help me through the discussion process. Otherwise, I'm just gonna sit there making 100 minigames and the release date of Disinherited is gonna have to be changed to sometime after the heat death of the universe. The deadline for the contest submissions was supposed to be today on the launching of this video, but since I messed up the audio last week and didn't get to post, I'm gonna extend it for another week. So there's the minigame. Another feature that I really want to add is like a menagerie of sorts. Lots of viewers have suggested customizing the cat with different colors and different clothes, and also more pets in general, including our channel's mascot, Franklin. I think it would be really fun if the mansion could be gradually filled with more and more pets, like a raven or a rat or a snake or something. Another feature that's closer to the essentials side is like a journal for Samuel. This could hold details and lore about bosses, NPCs, relics, etc. That would create a lot more opportunities for Dark Souls style lore and also another opportunity to use our hero's poetry in the game. Another thing I want to do is build out the shop area a little bit more. I've imagined this cook character that has a giant cauldron of perpetual stew. And maybe during runs you can pick up certain ingredients and then you'd have the opportunity to put those ingredients into the stew. The stew would heal you, but it would also give some extra bonuses like an attack benefit or defense benefit or the likelihood to get a certain kind of upgrade later. After a few times eating, the effect would fade out and you'd have to add more ingredients. These could even persist between runs, so it could create some interesting opportunities for planning what your next one is gonna be. We've talked a little bit about the idea of relic fusion, but also the idea of relic upgrades could be really interesting. And it's something that I've been toying with quite a bit. But that's enough dreaming about new mechanics. Let's talk about future areas. One very popular suggestion, especially with my musical background, has been a music themed area. And I am ecstatic to announce that it's coming. Through some discussions with my friend Cordy, a character and area concept that I'm absolutely in love with has emerged. It is completely unhinged, and it won't be done by the time 100 days is up, but it definitely will be included later. Look forward to it. Let's talk about later. As I have alluded to several times, Disinherited cannot possibly be everything that it's supposed to be by the time 100 days is up. In fact, I will still be lucky if even the bare minimum is finished. I think it's possible given my rate of progress so far, but it's gonna take a lot of effort. After the catacombs, if you've got the infinite machine and the chained monastery, then I want you to have two after that. At the moment, you've got Eudor's area for sure, but then there's a mystery area that you would also need. Of course, I could just have you be able to choose between whichever one you didn't pick and Eudor's area, and then you go to the bank after that, but I really would like for that extra area to be there. And that's just the small version of Disinherited. Ultimately, what I'd really like is to go Catacombs, two here, and then each one of these has two different sections, so the second tier has at least four. And even that is just a small version of Disinherited. As you can imagine, this structure allows for endless types of expansions down the line. So yeah, that's the kind of thing that I'm gonna be working on after the 100 days is up. Of course, this is all still subject to change. Everything's gonna depend on what's the most fun and the feedback that I get from playtesters. With a healthy dose of what I can actually accomplish. Like I imagine most of the people who are making it to this point in the video, ultimately I just want the game to be really good. Please enjoy some beautiful fan art while I thank some of the people who are directly helping this game come to life by supporting me financially, my channel members. There are now 31 of you lovely folks and I couldn't be more grateful. Extra big thanks to Ironic You Ask, the very first Reaper Council level member, and AJ Havoc, the second one. So now that my music camp is over, it's back to the development desk. Hopefully this gives you a nice bird's eye view of what to expect going forward. I literally can't wait to show you what I'm cooking up next for the Chain Monastery and beyond. So hit that subscribe button if you wanna follow along and I will see you in the next one.